Welcome everyone to MPA University's Hybrid Masterclass Week 4. I am Lauren Huffman, Director of Marketing Operations at Meeting Play Plus Eventry, and I'm again so excited to be moderating today's session. Today, we're going to be chatting about picking the right tech partners and the right partners just in the industry for your hybrid events with Jennifer Kellogg, Vice President of Operations at Meeting Play Plus Eventry, and Brenda Brody, SVP of Strategy and Client Services at Pine Rock. Prior to joining Meeting Play, Jennifer led Marriott International corporate meetings and events team for the past 10 years out of their headquarters in Bethesda, Maryland. Other past positions include Director of Events for Marriott's Midwest Regional Office in Chicago, Account Manager at Hargrove Inc. and River West Meeting Associates, and event and operation roles for the Governor of New Jersey, the White House, and several presidential campaigns and inaugurations. An alumni of Boston University, Jennifer is a member of their Career Advisory Network, where she guides current students and recent graduates in their career paths. She resides outside of Washington, D.C., where she enjoys home decorating, traveling, and visiting local vineyards and spending time with her two children. Brenda Brody is an entrepreneur, business executive, performing artist, podcast co-host, and an advocate for breast cancer patients. She is a leader in the experiential marketing industry for over 30 years. She currently serves as Senior Vice President of Strategy and Account Services at Pine Rock, Inc., where she is the founding employee. She also founded her own company, Bella Rose Associates, where she earned a women-owned business certification. By blending her broad business experience with her experience as a performer, Brenda fuses the worlds of business and art as an industry she calls business theater. She helps Fortune 500 and other large companies communicate their business messages, both internally and externally, by designing and producing live, virtual, and hybrid global meetings, events, and media. During her career, Brenda has led teams that received multiple industry awards, including the Tellies, the Communicator, and several international film and video awards. She has worked with numerous United States presidents, international stars of stage and screen, and amazing women leaders, including two of her favorites, Maya Angelou and Oprah Winfrey. She is currently co-host of Your Stories, Conquer Cancer podcast for Conquer Cancer Org slash ASCO, which is the American Society for Clinical Oncologists. She also mentors recently diagnosed breast cancer patients. In 2009, Brenda was honored as a woman to watch in business for JWI, which is the Jewish Women's International. Her education includes a business and master's in arts management and theater from American University. She currently lives in Maryland with her daughter who attends, who attends Towson University. To kick us off, we're going to be sharing the session poll and ask that everyone take some time to answer the questions as we welcome our speakers. I'm going to put the poll up now just so everyone can take a look. Everyone should be able to see it now. Let me see here. Let me make sure we're good. So then to kick us off, we're going to be bringing in today's amazing speakers. So please, everyone join me in welcoming today's speakers. Hey, Brenda. Hey, Jennifer. Hi. Welcome. Thank you, Lauren. Lauren, so much. Awesome. Brenda, well, I want um, to get over to you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> thank you so much, Lauren. I appreciate the introductions, uh, especially of uh, my good partner and friend, Brenda. Um, Brenda, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so delighted to be presenting this session with you. You know, when I think about great strategic partners, you definitely came to mind. We have a long history as partners together. And, you know, some of the aspects that make our partnership so successful are some of what we're going to talk about today. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you and I got started working together. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. When you called me and told me we were going to be talking about hybrid partnerships, I was really excited. One, I think the hybrid space is really a great opportunity for all of us, but especially talking about partnerships. I think when you were at Marriott and you were leading the meetings team, we really, you, me, and both our teams really had amazing success together, but and a lot of fun. A lot of laughs, right? Um, along the way. But and the reason and the reason for that was because you and your executives took the time to build the relationship with us, um, which didn't take long at all, mind you, but you also brought us to the table. You made us feel a, an extension to your team and your full disclosure. A lot of times folks don't want to talk about budgets, you know, they right away, and you guys laid everything out and gave us access 
to the executives and helped us understand the audiences and understand the execs. So we could really add value in all areas from creative to production. So I think a lot of uh, the keys to successes are the things that I mentioned. And a huge thing is relationships. And I'm just grateful that we've been able to partner together and mentor each other along the way. So I'm really excited to be here. And it was just as important for us to communicate with you and your team about the event, the attendee profile, what we did in past events, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and really that helped us get the results that we needed. You heard us, you adjusted, and you quickly became a trusted partner. In fact, I think there was one time when we were on site together, we were in the ballroom rehearsing and one of our executives had just gotten off stage. There was an issue with his presentation that I noticed right away and he wasn't happy. You took one look at me across the room and knew something was wrong and immediately addressed it. And I think that's the sign of a true partner, you know, when you can finish each other's thoughts and sentences. Um, in fact, I looked up the definition of partner and um, it said the um, a person who shares or is associated with another in some action or endeavor. And I think the shares in the endeavor part is really key to what makes a great partnership for me. And you embody that. Thank you. I back at you. I couldn't agree more. So let's jump in and see what we were going to cover today in our agenda. First, Brenda, you're going to talk a little bit about the meeting trends that you're seeing from a production side. Um, and we'll also talk about why partners are more important than ever right now, especially coming out of the global pandemic. We'll also talk about what to consider when selecting a partner and who to consider. So what types of partners will fit your needs? And then we'll talk lastly about how to best work with your partners. But before we get started, let's take a look at the poll results that we did earlier. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you said that less than 25% of your events will be hybrid this year. Um, Ty went to the 25 to 50 and 50 to 75 mark, and then the lowest was 75 to 100%. So those are interesting results. Uh, Brenda, why don't you talk to us a little bit about some of the current meeting trends that you're seeing in the hybrid space? Absolutely. So I, I just want to say before I, we talk about the current trends, I want to acknowledge and um, and celebrate the fact that the last two years of virtual meetings have been extraordinary for our industry. And it is exciting to see for those of us that are thriving in the virtual space to see how far we've come and how we've, I don't want to use the word perfected, but how we've evolved the virtual meeting space to meet the attendees' needs. And it, it's been an exciting journey um, for so many of us. But what we're seeing now, in the last five months, we've still been seeing virtual meetings, but people are craving the emotional connection opportunity with live meetings. And we've actually been doing numerous live meetings over the last five months um, in the United States, um, in just in case anyone's interested, some of the states that we've been doing these meetings in have been California, Colorado, Florida. Um, some of the industries that we've been doing these 100% in-person live, I should say, because both virtual is live as well, but in-person live, we have been doing, um, some of the industries have been financial, hospitality, we've been doing a lot in the hospitality space, and pharmaceutical. So we have seen people craving that live experience, but from a global perspective, we have been seeing hybrid significantly on the rise. And right now we're currently working on a meeting that um, that is going to be in, in the United States, it's gonna be regional. So a, a lot of what we're seeing with hybrid meetings is regionally based meetings. So we're seeing US, they're coming live in person and then we're streaming it virtually. Then our team's gonna be moving this particular event that we'll be flying to Dublin and we'll have a live audience in Dublin and we'll be streaming it as well live. And then they'll be heading to Pune 
India. And again, that for that region, it will be a true hybrid having in-person and virtual streaming um, as well there. Another meeting that um, we're working on, Disney Upfronts, we can finally talk about it, which is always exciting, as you know, from reading play as well. But um, that will be in the United States and it will be a live in-person meeting. And we have a significant number of attendees. And then there'll also be a virtual stream for about, uh, you know, probably another, um, you know, three or four times the live in-person audience. So that is what we're seeing right now. And still, as we all know, there's still a significant amount of virtual meetings. I was up five this morning. Hope I don't look like it. <laughs> but I was up. We did a global virtual forum for um, one of my favorite biotech clients. And that was an exciting opportunity, you know, knowing I was coming here today because to see how far this meeting has come. We've been doing it since the beginning of the pandemic. We what we heard from a um, from the attendees before the meeting was that they wanted no pre-records. Now there were a few, but they wanted the executives to be doing the meeting live. And so what we ended up a, a solution that we had was actually, and the executives did a great job with the meeting, but we also had camera shots of behind the scenes so that the audience members could actually see and know that this was actually happening real time. So there's lots of things that we're learning in this space, but I think you know, virtual meetings, as we all know, are here to stay, but people are excited to get back live. And I think we'll be seeing a lot more regional hybrid meetings on the rise. But now what about you? What are you all seeing? Yeah, we, interestingly enough, are starting to see a bit of that regional approach as well. We just started working with a large customer who's hosting 10 regional events in person mm -hmm. uh, across the country, and Meeting Play and Eventry is supplying the virtual platform. So it is interesting to see that as we uh, delve more into the hybrid space with clients, uh, the different approaches that they take, and that is one that we are starting to see as well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit uh, about why partners are more important than ever. You know, so many companies, especially those in the event industry, were severely impacted by COVID-19. Massive layoffs, staffing cuts, uh, both large and small companies letting go key event resources. So, um, and we also saw partners who went under completely, who were exceptional in one area, but couldn't adjust to survive in the new environment. And, you know, frankly, our industry responded almost immediately with at least some virtual options and more options came into the market throughout the first year of the pandemic. And now there are a large spectrum of options to choose from. So the question is, how do you navigate all of those options? And I think it's really important to find core partners who are best in class with a robust experienced team and multiple resources. You know, I think we'd all say that the ideal would be to find partners who have experience in the hybrid space, but we've all been living in the virtual world the past two years and hybrid is just now coming around. And a lot of companies are just now learning to shift from virtual to hybrid and navigating those changes. So, I think it's possible to find those, but really it's about finding companies with um, expertise. And, you know, Meeting Play and Eventry, we originated in the on site and mobile app space and then transitioned to virtual. So for us, combining the two was relatively easy. But we also work with a lot of agencies that also have this experience. If uh, any of you attended last week's session, you heard from Type A events. And they are a great partner to us and truly understand the hybrid space. So as the pandemic starts to slow down, we hope, and businesses start to grow their teams again, uh, there are a number of factors to consider when choosing partners. Brenda, do you want to start us off with what to consider? Sure. So what to consider for a hybrid meeting? Um, expertise. Does your partner 
have the expertise in hybrid. And when we say this, um, I want to echo what Jennifer said. We are all coming into this from uh, you know two years of virtual meetings. But it is important. Does your partner understand the live meeting experience and the virtual meeting experience? And how also, I, I heard the head of uh, Microsoft speak on a webinar and um, of events, and he was talking about, we really do need to think of this as one meeting, um, which I thought was really interesting to think about. Though there are two ways that people are getting the messaging, both live in person and live virtually, we have to make sure that we are thinking about this as one meeting. So when you're thinking about the expertise of the folks that you want to partner with, you want folks that understand the virtual space and understand the live space. Does your partner have the expertise in your industry? As I've heard from so many customers, that's so important, especially when there might be legal and regulatory things such as pharmaceutical and you know the biotech industry. But I'd like to encourage all of you to also think about partners that have experience in other industries. I hear over and over again from so many clients that they are so excited to learn that we have um, experience in other vertical markets. So our tech customer is dying to hear, what are, what's the pharmaceutical industry doing? What, you know, what's the financial industry doing? So I encourage you to ask your partners, yes, make sure they have experience in your industry, but what other industries are they working in and what are they learning and what are they doing for those industries that might be unique and different that you could then apply to your meetings and events. Um, and as Jennifer had mentioned, it's really great to find a partner that has multiple ser service offerings. As we've seen, unfortunately, some of our friends in the industry who were focused only on one service offering for live events who may have gone out of business the last two years. But like Meeting Play and Pine Rock, we have multiple service offerings and that can be of significant value for you. We'll talk a little bit later about streamlining and making sure you're streamlining your vendor partners. And that's a great way to help make sure that everybody is playing in the sandbox and, work, and working well together if you have companies that you're working with that have multiple service offerings for you. And when we talk about industry reputation and reliability, so absolutely you should take into consideration a partner's reputation. You know, look to your current or past partners um, and other trusted industry colleagues and ask them who they'd recommend. Um, like I said, there's a lot of new companies out there in this space. So it's even more important, I think, to leverage uh, those industry contacts that you have to really understand uh, who has done this well in the hybrid space. You know, talk to some of their customers and their vendor partners. How are they to work with? Do they really understand what it is that you're trying to achieve? And does that become part um, of their DNA as they're planning your event? Uh, what you're looking for are partners who ultimately will proactively connect with each other, which shows that they're invested in the entire event operating seamlessly. That's the sharing of the experience I talked about earlier. You know, they should all work on behalf of you, the client, to pull through your goals and objectives, but also keep each other accountable for these goals. As a partner working in a silo on just their portion of the event, that's not going to benefit you. Each part of the event needs to go flawlessly. And yes, each partner needs to make sure that their portion is exceptional, but they need to work together and think about all the parts of the event and how that will ultimately come together. From the event technology perspective, and that's you know virtual and mobile, reliability is also key. And this pertains to production as well. We've all experienced connectivity issues as we work remotely, but for your hybrid event, you need to make sure that your provider arranges for the proper bandwidth and that there are failover procedures should something happen. You know, a live stream goes down, part of the platform is showing an error. These things can happen. 
but how reliable are the systems to begin with? How are the backup plans? What are they? And how quickly can your partner work to rectify the issue? These are all conversations you should be having with your partners. What about strategy and approach? For strategy and approach, um, what to consider for your partner, I'll talk about in a second, but something that's Jennifer and I were talking earlier, something that's really important for your partners is for you all to have thought through what your objectives are, what your key messages are. Um, so your goals and objectives for your meeting, who your audience is. So that way, when you bring your partners on, you're bringing to the table right off the bat some key strategic things that we, Meeting Play and Pine Rock, need to know in order to help you. So that's something we recommend that you all have an internal meeting before you start even talking to your partners. But then once you establish that, bring us in and, and look for partners that can help you with strategy and messaging. Um, there's a wonderful tool we use called message mapping that we can help you bring your messages to life. And it's a great exercise to, to, to do in a strategic creative meeting. So, um, so then we can help you think through the attendee journey from before the meeting, during the meeting, and after the meeting, and the engagement that comes along with that that's appropriate for it. Jennifer, yes. do you want to talk from the event uh, tech perspective? Yeah, I think really the same thing goes for us. Um, you know, we have clients that that come to us without some of those pre-planning elements determined, and it just make it more challenging for us to uh, really understand their event to make the best recommendations. So we always recommend that once you've established those core elements that define the attendee journey, then we can provide guidance on what event technology you should use, how they pull together for the overall event, and even what features we can use for whether it's networking, engagement, gamification, um, some of those other key elements that might pull together the overall event and be able to connect both the in-person and virtual audiences. And then we all work together. Um, your partners should work in tandem together, um, such as meeting, play, and Pine Rock to make sure, as Jennifer was saying, this message is pulled through, but the look and feel as well is pulled through from the virtual platform through to the live, you know, even through to the set, so that the live set it is um, is mirroring the virtual set. So th it's a great opportunity when you have these strategy and creative sessions that you pull together your entire team, such as the folks um, like we that Jennifer and I work with. And then teams and resources for hybrid meetings. It's really important for your teams to have robust skill sets in both the live in person and the live virtual. Um, as far as creative strategy, media, there, uh, our media, our in house media department has been working overtime during virtual with pre records and all kinds of video production and graphics. So that's a really important element, as well as technology, both for audiovisual in person, as well as on the event tech side. And I think it's really important, Brenda, to really take a sort of a self assessment of your team and understand what gaps you may need to fill, right? I mean, if yeah. you have a robust internal team, you have planners, maybe you have video producers and graphic designers. Maybe a DIY do-it-yourself solution might be a better option for you. But if your internal resources are limited, you really need to look for something more full service that has project managers to help execute the work, client service managers, things of that nature to really um, help your team uh, take the event to the finish line. You also may be a company that has many small events and one large event, so you may need both options when you really uh, look at it and consider, consider all factors. So look for a, a company also that can scale between a DIY and a full service model. That's a great point, and that brings us to the, to the next slide and who to consider. Um, so things to consider are your agency partners. And there's a lot of different types of agencies that play in this space. 
um, that can supplement your internal folks. There's communications agencies, there's branding agencies, all that we're working with on these meetings in some form, PR and ad agencies sometimes get involved with, with all of us. And then there are the experiential marketing and production partners that are more full service. Um, oh, and I forgot the audio visual partners as well. That's a really important component. Um, but but you're, so it's up to you what you need. Um, and we can also help you. You could reach out to your, your partners to help assess what do you need to supplement, as Jennifer said. But for the full service companies like the Pine Rocks, we can help you in all areas from content and message design to production, um, as well as the audio visual on site. And when working with a full service agency, um, there are some things that you should expect to have. Um, a core team, and that's really important. Um, I hear constantly from clients that have worked with other companies that don't have a core team in place that's on all the calls and meeting with them um, that they haven't had the success rate that they need. And so who that core team is from a production perspective would be a really strong strategic account manager to work with you. And that person represents you also behind the scenes, understands your business, understands your key executives, has relationships with them, and understands what you need from a team perspective and is working with another core player, which is your executive producer, and as well as your creative strategist and your media producer. And those are our core team members that you will be working with. You know, it could be bi bi-monthly and then you start working weekly together, uh, but also feel confident, and, and I hope you do, with the partner you choose, if there's a team member that's just not working out, pick up the phone and call your account manager and let them know. Because sometimes folks just don't work well together and that's okay. And that's okay to let people know because sometimes it's an individual, it's not a company. And I that was a lesson for me too, working with some of our vendors. And it was a great lesson to learn because when you speak up, sometimes you just need to change a person in a position. So we usually we don't like to talk about the negatives, but I think that's important um, because you should have the relationship and an open, honest um, communication with your partners, and you should feel confident in that. Some other roles that are behind the scenes for those that may be interested that um, you know may not have worked a lot with a full service agency before, uh, the set designer, as we mentioned, also another important role for hybrid meetings is your technical director. And actually, sometimes we use two technical directors, one for the in-person, the, the ballroom and the breakout sessions, and one that's streaming and, and working with the folks in the studio that's streaming to your virtual platform, such as Meeting Play. Um, other things uh, to consider, uh, oh, additionally, with the in-house media, things that you can ask for that that if you don't have in-house resources for that that a full service company can help you with are video stingers, opening, closing um, stingers, lower thirds. I know Meeting Play has graphic capability, but if a platform you're working with doesn't, lower thirds and speaker bumpers and things like that for the virtual that also tie to the live because that's a really important thing we need to think about with hybrid, we need to make sure visually, as well as from a communications perspective, everything is looking and feeling like one meeting. And then one of my favorite, and it's actually to me, um, a really, a key role and uh, that we've been providing for numerous years is a speech coach. I encourage those of you that think you have executives that might need support it's a great value add person to bring in. Um, the speech coach, we actually, during, during the pandemic, we actually brought a CNN correspondent in to work with the executives on how to present in this virtual environment. It's not easy. 
I, you know, I wish I could see all of you. I'm used to being a live stage performer and working the room. And it's a different experience when we know we're talking individually to each of you that are, you're in your offices or your home offices. And to have a person that can work with your executive and also to streamline their speeches and make sure that their speeches land with the audience. And I say that from the virtual and live perspective, but this role is crucial as we move into the hybrid experience because you are going to have folks live presenting. You may have virtual presenters that are coming in to the stage live and they need to really practice and hone their skills on how they're going to reach both audiences. And I think for all of us, getting that messaging across in a hybrid environment is going to be an exciting opportunity. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, I can attest to Brenda to the comment about um, it definitely being a different environment when you have to present virtually. Like you, I've performed on stage for many years uh, on the side. And I think I get more nervous doing things like this than I ever have being on stage. So it's definitely a different beast. Um, so let me talk a little bit about planners. Um, I come from the planning world, a long career in planning, and really I think the planner category can be a very, very broad one. You can um, work with independent event planners all the way up to event management companies that have a lot of different uh, departments and elements, even trade show companies I would throw into that mix. So many different parts of your event could warrant different partners. Some companies have internal event planners, whether they're small or large teams. Um, recently, I've seen that a lot of companies have added um, at least one, and, and some are a team, of digital or technical project managers. Um, one company we work with has an entire technical team um, that are not specific to uh, the tech of technical, but really they are event planners that um, know the virtual and hybrid space and, and can help the rest of the team plan according to the expertise that they have. So, um, so we see a lot of that lately, and, and that's definitely a benefit. And if your company doesn't have a position like that, of course, you can reach out. A lot of agencies have that type of position now, and, and that could be a, a good added resource. Uh, we also do see some clients who come to us without a production company or an agency, and we have some of those resources within our company for those clients, but we also recommend that working with a small event planning company or an individual planner to help with the day-to-day -day logistics uh, of a hybrid event, in particular, the in-person elements, is always beneficial. Your event tech partner, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, they, of course, are focused on the technology, but you do need someone, whether they're in your company or someone you hire externally, that can handle the day-to-day -day logistics of the in-person and how that connects to the event technology. If you have sponsors or exhibitors, um, as I mentioned, trade show companies can be really an extension of your planning team. I've been really fortunate in my uh, past career that I worked with a trade show company who was really my right arm in Audi Expo. They were the definition of a great partner, always willing to go beyond um, their scope for whatever was needed. And they would literally do anything that we needed in order to make the event a success. A success. And I think just that um, really encapsulates what a good partner should be, no matter what type of partner they are. Moving on to event technology, and really here we're talking mobile, uh, virtual, on-site, uh, registration, and all of those surrounding elements. There are a ton of providers in this space right now. Some provide a more DIY solution, and some are full service. Um, meeting plan eventually happens to offer both. Um, and it's good to have that flexibility, but you really need to decide based on your event goals, what it is that you need, a along with, of course, making that assessment, as I talked about earlier, of, you know, assessing your team and what your skill levels are and your abilities and where you might need to fill in the gaps. And along with that comes, you know, choosing the right event tech partners. But um, looking for a partner that does have a more robust offering really allows you to shift your needs based on the nature of the event. Um, the scope of your team and the capabilities um, of your other partner resources. So looking for a partner that can um, adjust 
from I'll say a tier three to a tier one, if you need that is really crucial. And some of the things that a full service event tech provider can provide for you are everything from call for papers to registration, the virtual mobile on-site check-in piece, badge printing, session scanning, lead retrieval, even thinking about remote and on-site technical support is really important when it comes to the event technology side. I will say the more partners you have to pull in for these elements, the harder it is to successfully manage all of your partners, especially when you consider it's not just event tech, it's your production, your agency, all of your in-person planners. So really trying to look for more, more partners that can provide um, sort of a 360 uh, approach is a really good option. Um, also think about whether a partner's current offerings satisfy your needs or if you need a more customized approach. That's um, really key to looking at different event tech partners and determining what would best fit your needs. Are they constantly innovating and offering new products? Do they have resources that can ideate with you to offer something fresh and new? Um, and how can they help you connect the virtual with the in-person attendees? You know, from a planner perspective, I know year to year, you want to be able to offer something new at your events. So look for someone that can help you provide some new elements that fit your needs. If you're working with any third parties that may need to integrate with your event tech provider, make sure that they have a dedicated contact who can interface with the event tech team. And that's really just to make sure that their tools and solutions can integrate really smoothly into the platform. Um, lastly, think about a graphic design option and you know, what graphic design you may need to integrate into your event. Do you have a graphic designer on your internal team? Do you have one externally? If not, your event tech provider may have one who you can work with to develop the platform graphics and they would know, of course, all of the particular specifications for the platform that would be needed. And moving on to hotel and event venue, when we're talking about hybrid, of course, we need to have a conversation about your event venue. So you want to look for a hotel or an event venue who candidly is willing to be flexible with the contract terms. I think most of them have learned to be flexible in the COVID environment, and you should use that to your, to, to your advantage to negotiate with them, to see if they'll allow you to increase or decrease the in-person portion of the event should things shift or change about the current health protocols, for example. Um, they should be able to allow certain intervals of the planning process to look at those elements, F&B, space rental, guest rooms, to see if you might be able to make those adjustments uh, prior to a certain cutoff date. They should also be flexible to allow you to work with multiple external event partners. Um, I know that's not always easy. Some venues have specific partners that they require you work with. But again, I would say in this environment that they um, definitely want your business. So um, look for the partner and the venue that will be flexible with you to uh, work with the partners that you want to bring in. That's great. And also your local event partners out really important um, for all of us right now um, with some folks um, being lean on staffing. And so reach out to your destination management company in the city. They could be helping with party planners for some of your events um, that you'll be doing locally, as well as your convention and visitors bureau. They are a wealth of information, and especially right now, as we want to make sure we understand from city to city, state to state, country to country, what the COVID protocols are. So lean on your local event partners and don't forget about them. They're a great resource. And that brings us to the next slide, which is lessons learned um, with hybrid and virtual events. And we're still learning. All of us are still learning together, but we've come so far in the last two years. For those of us, you know, most of us had done a portion before, uh, before the pandemic of virtual, but the last two years have been incredible, the lessons we have learned. And now in the hybrid space, for those of us that have done some hybrid meetings now and are honing that craft, I think we're all going to continue to learn together um, but you want, you want a company that understands how to support you in that way. 
And for you all, plan smarter. This is, though we want to talk about this being one meeting, that it's two different experiences that, that we're all creating together for two different audiences on how they're viewing this one meeting. So leave time. Make sure that there's enough time. We know the executives you might not get um, until last minute, and that's just typical, and we understand that. But get your teams together, get your vendor partners together early, so that way we can have the time to plan all the logistics as well as the content and message um, for a hybrid meeting, which is it's more there are more nuances and more work to be done for both audiences. Don't overproduce. That's something we have learned in virtual. We are all zoomed, teamed, everything out. I don't know about you, but I definitely, I, since I'm not traveling anywhere, I have been sitting at my desk from morning till night, back-to-back -back meetings. We're all tired and we're all craving in-person meetings, but for virtual and hybrid, as well as live, don't overproduce them. I know everyone wants to know what's the latest technology. We need to know so we can showcase it. And there's great technology out there, AR, VR, and for live meetings, there's um, projection mapping, gamification. There's so much that we, your team, the folks at Meeting Play and Pine Rock and other vendor partners of yours can help you come up with. But everybody wants to authentically, emotionally connect. We, we're dying for those smaller experiences. So let's go back to basics and make sure that we're thinking through the messaging and the audience and what we need to deliver to them to get the results that you need. And then we'll decide what technology is best. I just highly recommend you don't pick tech for tech's sake. Um, three, networking is king. That's all we've been hearing lately. Everyone is trying to find new ways to connect in smaller groups. And the folks that figure out the most authentic ways to do that and the easiest ways to do that, I think will have extraordinarily successful events and high ratings because you want to connect and people want to connect with similar audiences, but they also want to connect with different people for lessons learned as well. And people are having FOMO. Jennifer was, was talking about with me earlier machine learning and that People want to know more about what interests others have and what sessions others are attending. They don't want to miss out on something someone else is doing. So um, that's something to think about with networking. And know your audience. We talked about keep it short. Everybody's tired. But also think about your global audience. And when you think about them, time zones, translations, closed captions, firewalls, um, know the level of engagement that's going to be effective. And you don't have to know that, but give your partners the information that we all need to help figure that out. Swag is still something everybody loves, both in person and virtual. Uh, I know Jennifer and I, when she was at Marriott, we would have hours and hours of discussions about swag alone, right, Jennifer? <laughs> It was unbelievable, but it was how do we find the newest thing that's going to really speak to the audience? Um, also, from the virtual audience, consider a MC because know that they feel disconnected from the live audience. That some of them may be having, some of them may not. I know there are people that are not interested in going back live, but and in person. But have an MC guiding them through the journey. That's something you might want to think about. And don't forget the swag boxes, the meals. Um, one of my colleagues, Joe, mentioned everybody uh, on the last meeting he had loved DoorDash gift cards. So think about that. And um, Q&A, gamification, entertainment, all of that um, will come once you're working together and figuring out what's best for your audience. But the key is to know your audience and also to include them pre-event surveys, polls, like Lauren did earlier for us. That was very interesting to see what you all had to say. Social walls, meetups. 
These are all things that help you and help us working with you connect with your audience. Choose your partners wisely. Make sure you have the confidence in your partner that you can be blunt and tell them what you need. Build the relationship. Take the time to build a strong relationship. And make sure your partners are flexible. Virtual meetings, in-person meetings, there's a lot of last-minute stuff. I saw it this morning when I was at our biotech client. It, the meeting was pretty much wrapped up, but uh, two executives last minute had a bunch of script changes. No problem. You know, we laughed it off. We all were having fun in the moment. It was no big deal. Make sure that you have partners that are just flexible. We know what you all are going through is stressful. Make sure you have partners that are making you have fun along the way and laughing through it all. And make sure that your goals are your agency's goals. It's really, really important. And um, Jennifer, do you want to talk about, I loved what you and I had discussed before the meeting about streamlining of your partners. Do you want to talk about the call you had with multiple partners? Yeah. And, you know, I think it's really important, um, again, because as a planner and, and as some of you, I know some of your teams um, have um, limited resources, especially over the past couple of years, you know, wanting to really look across the board as you're looking at partners and determine and think about, you know, which are the key partners to work with. I was on a uh, kickoff call um, a couple weeks ago where I, I feel like there were 20 partners that introduced themselves. And, and that can be a lot for um, a planning team to, to handle, to make sure that every um, partner is doing what they need to do and make sure that they're integrating with the rest of the partners um, and to really keep tabs on them. So again, looking at partners that can have a, a more robust offering uh, allows you to really kind of limit how many partners you really need to work with at the end of the day. But let me uh, finish us off with um, some tips on how best to work with our partners. It's it's not unlike some of the information you provided, Brenda, but you know we really want to drive this point home because we think it's really critical to a good partnership. Be transparent with your expectations with your partners. Don't pull back any information and pull them in as an extension of your team. As we said at the very beginning with our story about how Brenda and I started working together, that was the key to our success. It was being completely transparent, offering up any information on both sides and making sure that we are both moving in the right direction um, as far as the goals and objectives of the conference. Clearly define success and communicate that to your partners. How will success be measured? How do you define success for this particular event? How will you determine your ROI? Uh, the more your partners know about what you define as success, the better equipped they will be to help you achieve it. Brenda talked about knowing your audience. There's, this is twofold. You as the client need to understand the audience that's attending your event and doing things like attendee surveys and elements like that. But you also have goals perhaps for the event as well. So what do you want the audience to, to know, think, feel, and do by the end of the event? Those all need to be defined. And then determine the most effective level of engagement. I have seen a number of times where um, a, and a client may not know their audience very well and go real heavy into the networking and gamification angle. But really what the attendees are looking for are you know, the learning piece. They wanna to come to the sessions, they wanna hear what the, the speakers have to say and that's their primary goal. So the engagement scores fall very low. So the, the knowing your audience plays into this heavily um, but like Brenda said, don't do tech for tech's sake. You know, think through what you need to communicate, how you want your attendees to engage with other attendees to enhance their experience, and then determine the best te technology to use for it. Overall, I think our message today is to find the right partners that you feel confident with, that you can become, that they can become an extension of your team. Uh, they should understand your team, your company, and your goals. Um, you know, we all know how stressful it can be to be an event planner and to plan events, especially now in the hybrid environment. So you should make sure that you have partners who you can trust and ultimately um, have a great partnership and relationship with and just have fun. Right, Brenda? Yep, that's our goal. <laughs> Life is short.
So Lauren, I will turn it back to you to see if we have any questions that we can answer. Hey, that was a wonderful session, ladies, and a very nice way to end it. We had a couple of people say um, in the chat, just to have fun. I think that's really like the key of events at this point. We've gone through two years of learning and lessons and change, and I'm sure, you know, we're still experiencing that to this day, but, you know, we want to make sure that fun is always, you know, the key thing that we're doing. That's what an event's supposed to be, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Well, we have a ton of Q&A. A lot of people have great questions that came in from your session. So I'll just kind of go through these. We'll answer them in, you know, a conversational way. And then if we don't uh, catch all of your questions, we do have the hallway chatter afterwards where we can answer anyone else's questions, kind of go into them with a little bit more uh, detail. We have folks from Pine Rock. We have folks from Meeting Play Plus Eventry. So we will be there to continue the chatter. All right, I'm going to just start from the top. So what was what was your most interesting way you were able to make your virtual event engaging and feel like a novel experience? That's from Alan. Uh, I think I can take this one. We actually recently uh, worked on an event with uh, a company where they pulled in, uh, really it's a, a graphic engagement partner and they provided all of the graphics that ultimately we um, integrated with those to provide uh, various um, activities throughout the platform. It really ultimately looked like a video game. Um, and, and that was uh, the nature of this particular company. Uh, that was, uh, it was just a perfect environment and a perfect virtual platform for them. Didn't look like anything else that we typically do. Uh, we've done this event for them uh, two years in a row. And so the partnership, um, we worked with Blueprint Studios on those graphics and the partnership between Blueprint, the client and meeting play uh, really worked together so that we had the pre-meetings to really understand what the event goals were, uh, to really understand what some of those initial graphics were that were coming to the table, to work through some of the changes along the way and the client ultimately blessing those to make sure that ultimately the virtual platform and the, um, the, the user experience at the end of the day through that platform was the optimal experience for the client. So it was a really unique opportunity to do something completely different in, in the virtual space. And it, it turned out exceptionally well. That's great. Do you find that unique experiences are becoming more common or is it hard to find the the sweet, sub, sweet spot between being super unique and really out of the box, but being very effective at the same time. I feel like it's hard to find the right way to do that. I think from what you're talking about, they had, but I'm just curious, what are you seeing now as far as an industry-wide standard? You know, I think, um, I don't see it so much as, you know, where in-person events, I feel like there was a little bit of competition. You know, you might have had mm -hmm. um, external attendees attending multiple um, different uh, corporate events or, or client events where they're comparing one to the other. Who is the entertainment here versus there? What swag did I get here versus there? And really, I think more now, they're really competing against themselves, looking mm -hmm. at what did I do last year and how can I make it better? Or even as Brenda mentioned, you know, we did so much last year year because we felt like we needed to really blow it out of the water. And now that we know a little bit more about virtual and hybrid, maybe we can pull back a little um, and really hone in mm -hmm. on some of the elements that really made the event successful. So uh, it's really more of an internal um, you know, look at what they've done in the past to, to determine what they're moving forward with in the future. I agree with you, Jennifer. And also, um, we've, we've seen Choose Your Own Adventure, where virtual attendees are choosing who goes first, who goes second, who they're hearing from, what they're hearing. So there's a lot of opportunity in the virtual space, which, you know, will come into the hybrid space as well to be unique. Yeah, I completely agree. So a little bit of a change of pace, but a popular question that people want to hear about is how do you deal with particularly difficult clients from a commu communication perspective or otherwise? Well, I, I'm an account manager. You want me to take that one, Jennifer? <laughs> um, you know, I have to say, when we say difficult client, I think we talked about relationships. I think it's really important to get to know the person because I think that once you get to know what triggers them, are they really difficult? Are they fear-based? 
They're afraid of something, whatever that something is. But as an account manager, understanding what what that person is afraid of, I think you would find that um, maybe they're not as difficult as you thought. Now, some clients are you know very demanding and want short turnarounds and things like that. Um, that's difficult too sometimes because you have to say no. And that's the hardest thing to do. Um, I think for anyone I've learned through the years, saying no is really challenging, especially to a more challenging client. But when you explain to them why you're saying no, I think they, they get it if you have the relationship, if it's going to impact the show. So I think it's all about we can say that they're, they're difficult clients, um, but I think it's about getting to know the person and getting to know um, what their triggers are and what they're worried most worried about, what's keeping them up at night, and then mm -hmm. helping be two steps ahead, as we talked about from the beginning with Jennifer. She wasn't a difficult client, don't worry. <laughs> but, but we'll talk later. No, I'm joking. But but it's it's reading the client. And, and being two steps ahead and knowing what's needed. So that's that's my take on it. Jennifer, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would also go back to, um, you know, being a partner, you know, wherever it's coming from, if you're not treating your other partners, whether it's a client and a partner, a partner to client, then, um, you know, that's where you could come across some of that, those issues. Um, if you both go into it knowing that, you have the, the same goals and objectives, you're both going down that path and you treat each other as if you are partners through the process. I think that also really makes a difference so that if something should happen that you are not happy with, it, it, it defines how you approach it. It's not the client uh, contractor relationship, it is a partnership. And you look at it and say, okay, this isn't exactly uh, what I was looking for. What else can we do to get to this goal that I'm trying to reach? And having those conversations, yes, communication is ultimately key. Having those conversations are really important as opposed to assuming something is wrong uh, or assuming a partner has done something wrong and, and approaching it that way. So I think that's really important to keep in mind as well. That's yeah. Good. Yeah. We have another popular one. Um, how do you approach the budget conversations of hybrid, considering it's essentially supporting a full live event plus a full virtual event? Any tips or tricks of how to speak with key stakeholders on budget? Well, the budget's going to be more. So I, I think that, you know, that's that's a hard thing um, probably to grapple with. I know some folks I've heard on webinars saying, you know, it's not going to be more, but um, I, I do believe it will be more um, from what we're seeing. And I think open and honest communication is key and sooner rather than later. Um, we're seeing budgets of hybrid meetings and virtual backups because folks are getting close to the meeting and for whatever reason, they might have to switch. Um, we are seeing that as well. But I think um, the other portion of what you said about um, approaching the subject. Approaching it with key stakeholders. Yeah. With key stakeholders. I think honesty is key, but you have to show the value and what the value is to the attendees, because that's what the key st stakeholders care about. How is it going to move their objectives, their business ROI? And once they understand that, then they can understand the value of the budget that you're presenting to them as well. Yeah. And it goes back to knowing your audience ultimately, right? So, you know, look at your event budget, you know, what you may have done for your in-person events uh, pre-pandemic um, doesn't have to be, you know, the same budget numbers don't have to be in your budget for a hybrid event. Um, I've seen a number that are coming back into the fold and they, they, again, swag is popular, right? They go crazy with the swag, but I've also seen clients who have significantly pulled back in that area and it's completely understandable by the, by the attendees. They understand budget constraints, you know, 
know, were those things nice to have? Of course. Are they a need to have for their experience? No. So you really need to understand some of these different elements and what is most important. Um, because if you can pull back on some areas, then ultimately what you need to spend to activate hybrid um, should, should be a wash in some cases if you can really leverage some of those other areas to pull in the, that funding. I'm glad you said that, Jennifer, because that just reminded me of something. What we're also seeing a lot of is those five-day meetings that folks might have been doing are now three days. Those three-day meetings mm -hmm. are done in a day and a half, which is also saving significant dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. another, another thought um, of how you can look at your budget as well, because uh, it's, it's what we're seeing attendees needing and wanting. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Well, we have a ton of more questions, but we're out of time for this, you know, general session. However, again, we have the hallway chatter. I'm going to bring all these questions over to hallway chatter so that if folks have time, we'll be over there to answer them. Um, if not, we can always kind of move these over to our next session and see if we can answer them then. So join us next week. But thank you both so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Week four, we have two weeks. And Lauren, if anybody has any questions that they don't want to speak of a lot, you know, in this forum, I'm happy to, and as I'm sure Jennifer is, I'm happy to chat with anyone. So feel free to give my contact information if someone reaches out. Awesome. That's, that's great. Well, thank you guys so much. We'll see you over in hallway chatter. We'll see everyone else um, next week for our session five um, topic, which is marketing your hybrid event and building sponsorships with Brandy Plot and Meg Fazy. So they will be coming on one o'clock Eastern next week on Thursday. And in the meantime, please feel free to share this, come back for on demand if you've missed sessions um, and we will see you next week. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks. Thanks. Sure.